world-class scientific research requires advanced computing support at every stage. That's why Jefferson Lab is blazing new trails in data science. The lab's data forward agenda includes a detailed plan for managing data from source to archive. Whether it's generated in supercomputing simulations of advanced theory, generated in support of real-time processing for experimental operations, or generated in nuclear physics experiments at Jefferson Lab. For instance, this means storing as much as one gigabyte of new lab experimental data every second, adding up to 100,000 gigabytes every day. Once stored and carefully archived, the data can be accessed, compared, and analyzed by researchers around the world now and into the future. I'm Dr. David Lawrence, and welcome to the fourth installment in the Jefferson Lab Bite Size Science Series. So today I'm going to talk to you about artificial intelligence, or AI, in a nutshell. So if you're like me, you've probably heard the term AI all the time over the last couple of years, and maybe you're wondering a little bit about what is this, how does it actually work? So I'll try to tell a little bit about that today. So first off, what is artificial intelligence? Um, well, maybe it's worth it to spend a minute to say what is intelligence? A few definitions uh, that I found are the ability to learn or understand or to deal with new or trying situations, a capacity for learning, reasoning, understanding, similar forms of mental activity, uh, the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. All these things are things you probably would think of or probably consistent with what you're thinking about the word intelligence is, and that's good. Um, but artificial, when we think of that, um, that means something that's man-made. Um, so intelligence, we usually attribute as a property of a living creature, in particular the human brain, but when it's artificial, it's something that we've made to try to mimic the thing that is occurring in nature. So if we look at how the human brain works, the human brain is made up of a bunch of cells called neurons, and these neurons are connected together and they have inputs and outputs. The neurons have signals in them. When a neuron fires, the signal will go from its inputs out to its outputs, and that's how the whole thing gets connected together in a big network, a neural network. The place where these things meet is really the important part. If we look at this, it's the synapse of where the two neurons will meet each other. Um, we can have a signal that travels from one neuron into the other. It's shown here as the green, and as it goes across this gap, this connection, that's where you can really see the the thing we might call memory or knowledge being implanted. So the signal may have a certain size going into it, but then this connection, the strength of this connection is something that can vary between different neurons, how any two neurons are connected. So I put arbitrary numbers here. Say I have a signal coming in that's 2.4, and I have a synapse strength that's 0.5, then the, the signal that gets through to the other side is just the product of those two things. And I can write this down in a kind of pseudo math formula here where I have X is my input and W is the weight. It represents how strong this connection is between the two sides of the synapse. And it creates the number that goes on the other side, which you call Y. Now, if I have a neuron that's connected in a big network, I have more than just one thing connected. I'll have uh, many of them connected. And in this little picture, I show four of them. And so the, uh, the, the, Green dots are different size, representing different size signals from the different neurons feeding into the inputs of this one neuron on the right. And then the different size signals that come out of that synapse are somehow combined together to tell the, the neuron whether or not it to fire and how strong it should fire. So I can also write this down in some kind of pseudo math formula where I have several different inputs. All of them have different weights because the synapses are different. And those numbers are then combined to give me the full output here. So there's a number of numbers that are included here in order to, to make the Z value that comes out in the end. So that network is, is kind of how a basic uh, network is built. We can build these artificial networks by putting lots of layers together and multiple output layers. So in this case, I have um, four inputs and three outputs. And if you know matrix algebra, you might see some of these uh, equations over on the right look a little bit familiar, but if you don't know it, that's okay. You don't really need to. The important thing is that every one of these lines shown in this picture on the left represents another number. It's a weight connect of how strong that input neuron is connected to that output neuron. And um, those are all combined in some way to give us three different outputs for every set of inputs we come in here. 
uh, or we have coming in. So for example, my inputs could be coming in from uh, an eye. Your eye is a sensor, it has some cells in it that can detect light that are like pixels. These can be associated with the inputs. And the outputs, you may have go through a network and decide what action should I take based on what I have seen. So for example, if I see a dog, you might say, this is a nice looking dog, I should go pet that dog. That's the action that you should take, that your brain tells you from your, from your experience in life. You may see another animal that you might have a different reaction, a different action is uh, suggested by your brain, maybe you should run away, or maybe not run away, maybe just slowly put down your stuff and back away. Uh, I'll let you look up on the internet how to properly escape from a bear in the wild. Uh, but you may also see things like another animal and have kind of a mixed reaction. Uh, should I run away from this guy or should I pet him? Uh, and there you might have numbers that show up in the actions of these two different things you could do that are kind of comparable in size. And that would be what would happen when you're kind of undecided on something. So just like your brain can be undecided, uh, you can have neural networks that uh, in, in a computer that are not clear what the decision of what action to take. And we have to deal with those type of situations as well. So the type of networks I've shown you now is really short because they have only two layers in them, but in reality, we have very deep networks to do lots of um, calculations. In. So here we have a, a network that's shown with a bunch of hidden layers. You could have any number of hidden layers with any number of neurons in between. And uh, each one of these lines on the layers uh, represents another number. And so you get a lot of numbers in here uh, that are used in the calculation of what goes into your output layer. So you may ask, okay, artificial intelligence, why is this such a big deal now? Haven't we known how the brain works for a long time and wanted to do this um, kind of stuff? And the answer is absolutely, we have. Uh, artificial intelligence is a term that was coined all the way back in the 1950s. Ever since then, there's been, this has been studied by computer scientists and cognitive scientists and more recently, a lot more by data scientists and how this works. Um, here at Jefferson Lab, we've done a number of things over the years that have involved this. Uh, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, we controlled a cryo target in the class experiment with a type of AI called fuzzy logic. Um, we also did some uh, detector design optimization nearly a decade ago using boosted decision trees, which is another type of AI. Um, but the last couple of decades, we've really seen uh, a very steady, actually a very increased, uh, almost exponential growth of the critical technology that's really kind of paved the way for us having artificial intelligence be such a big deal now. And that was thanks to one very particular industry, video games. So not necessarily this type of video game, but more modern video games where you'll see large numbers of pixels, and every one of these pixels, uh, you have to do a, a lot of calculation to find exactly what it should be. There's the color of what it is that it's looking at, uh, what is the uh, the light sources, what are the light sources, there may be multiple ones pointing at it, are there shadows, is there mist in the way, um, all this kind of stuff. It's a lot of calculations for every pixel. It has to be done 30 or 60 times a second on modern machines. Uh, it's a lot of computation. And in order to do that, um, you kind of need specialized hardware. And that specialized hardware was driven by the gaming industry. The gaming industry now is larger than the film industry in the amount of um, uh, dollars that uh, go into it every year. And it drove the development of these devices called graphics processing units, or GPUs. So these have been around for a while, but they have also steadily grown in the power and their capability uh, to the point now that they are just enormously powerful compute engines that we can use for all kinds of things. At one point, businesses and scientists have seen these uh, compute engines and realized we could do more than just calculate graphics with this. We can do calculations for science projects with this. And so they started using these things and outfitting data centers. And then the industry kind of caught on that that was a, a different use case for their product. So they started designing products that are geared specifically towards large data centers that have these large compute requirements in them. And, and so we now tend to, to fill these up with thousands of these cards uh, in order to do massive amounts of calculation uh, for different things. It also turns out that this particular architecture that we use for this is really well suited for doing artificial intelligence 
type networks. So how do we use this here at Jefferson Lab? Well, um, there's a lot of different places where we can, but this is one that's kind of cool. So this is a, uh, a, a, a project that was done with a class 12 detector in uh, experimental hall B. This is taking what they call an autoencoder type network. An autoencoder network takes some a set of input, a large set of inputs, and usually it's a picture. Um, in this case, you can look at this top one. It's a, a handwritten digit seven. There's a number of different handwritten digits here, but just take the top one as an example. And it kind of narrows it down to a very small waste at there. There's only a few numbers. Then it tries expanding it back out into a lot of numbers again, which represent the picture again. So you have all the pixels going in, you have all the pictures pixels coming out, but a very few numbers kind of representing it in the middle. Now, um, the way we train this thing is we give it, here's the noisy picture on the left, and here is, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the clean picture on the right. And we tell it that you need to try and adjust all the little numbers, those Ws, the weights inside the model, until it comes out to look like the clean picture. And that means you're really distilling to the essence. We don't necessarily know what every one of the individual numbers in this little uh, piece in the middle mean. It's kind of an encrypted thing, but we know that it's the essence enough that it can reproduce this, which is clean. Over on the right, we see some pictures from um, a detector, and I, I can't go into the details of uh, the detector here because we just don't have time, but I can tell you if you look in the middle column here, each, each one of these rows is a different event, and the middle column is showing uh, what a detector would res response would be to a number of particles flying through this uh, detector, small subatomic particles. And the the middle column is the clean picture, what it should look like. On the left, though, is what we tend to see coming out of the detector. There's a lot of noise with extra hits because it's a very busy environment because we're trying to take a lot of data at once. So there's a lot of different particles running around there. But if we train the AI, AI properly, the model can clean up all of those um, extra hits in there and give us back a picture that looks much cleaner than what we read from the detector. This allows us to do a much better analysis on the data and extract the signal much cleaner. Another thing we do with these big nuclear physics experiments, uh, which produce a lot of data, they require a lot of monitoring. We want to ensure that the data that we take is um, of high quality. You don't want to have uh, a lot of time and effort and money spent on doing an experiment only to find out a couple of months later when you're analyzing the data that you've, uh, there was some mistake that could have been fixed if you'd have caught it. So we end up monitoring this quite frequently. Um, scientists will sit on shift 24 hours a day, seven days a week when one of these experiments is running and watch these plots, dozens of these plots, and among other things that they have to do, but they have to kind of watch and make sure that these graphs are all looking correct. Um, this can be kind of tedious, especially when you're on, you know, the night shift, 3 a.m., looking at the plots for the umpteenth time. Uh, so it can be kind of prone to human error. The other thing is that not all scientists who go in there on shifts are equally expert in all of the detector systems that are put together. One of these big detectors is actually made up of lots of different smaller detector systems, and we have experts for each of them. Um, because you can't necessarily be an expert on it, maybe they might miss things that if we could set the expert down to watch all the time, they would catch. So with an AI, what we do is we have an expert sit down and label a bunch of images. They'll look at an image and say, this is good, or this is bad, or this is something else. You can have any number of categories. And they'll put those labels on it, and we'll use that to train an AI. An AI model will then look at the pictures and will be able to tell us what the expert would have said if they looked at that picture. And the nice thing about this is that, of course, computers can run and look at these pictures much more frequently than we can. They don't get tired, and uh, they, they won't um, uh, give a different answer if it's 3 in the morning versus being at 10 in the morning. So um, if you look at a picture like this, if I was looking at this at some time, I would see very obviously there's a, a hole here, the detector where it should be blue. That might jump out to me. Uh, what I might be less likely to see is something over here where it's just a little bit darker. That would be an easy one to miss while I'm scanning through lots of different plots. But the AI picks up on this very easily, and it will tell me or alert the user on shift that, hey, there may be a problem here, and you should take a look at it. Another kind of cool thing that we're doing, uh, extracting some quantum information from the data. So a lot of the times when we take data, we will take it and what we'll see is kind of a combination of a lot of different quantum states 
that are combined together into an image that we would see. If in this case, it's just a two-dimensional image that just shows the, the angle, angles of the particles in a particular reaction. And as I said, it's, it's a combination of lots of different quantum states that go into this, and, and we can't get into the details of it, but the pattern is, is kind of unique on what that particular combination is. Um, in order to figure this out, we go back and use uh, take a page from that autoencoder type um, scenario where we will build an autoencoder-like network, but instead of having it go down to the waist and go back up so it's all one network, we take this last half of it and replace it with calculations based on known physics. So that way we're only training the first half of the model, we give it the picture, then we get a set of quantum numbers that we want to try to generate a picture from using known techniques to, to regenerate that picture that we can compare to the input. And once we get all that right, we'll know the quantum number. And then we can put any picture in there and it'll tell us immediately, here's the quantum states that contributed to this particular um, data set. So there's a lot of things uh, in, in artificial intelligence, machine learning, that um, a lot of different areas, and we can't go into all of them. Uh, we talk about supervised learning where you basically have some labeled data where you know what the output is give it for a given set of inputs. We train the model up on that so when we give it a new set of inputs that we don't know the output, it can give us a good prediction on what that output should be. There's also unsupervised learning. Uh, this is something more along if you want to try to group things into categories and you don't necessarily know the categories ahead of time, that you gave it a bunch of pictures and some of them were cats and dogs and horses and you didn't know what any of these animals are. It might group them together and say, these all look like they belong together over here and those look like they belong together over there, that kind of thing. But we can also apply that to types of physics reactions. Um, another really exciting part or uh, area is something called reinforcement learning. And this is what, um, uh, maybe the, the best example is when a baby learns how to walk. Uh, most babies, uh, humans or otherwise, uh, are born with a capacity to know or to learn how to walk, but they don't know how to walk. They have to get up and try it, and they fall down, and then they get up and try again, and they have to do this many, many times in order to learn. So you can do this in other areas if you, say, have a robot that you want to have learn how to, how to walk. This is just a little hobby project that um, I've worked on with some friends. And uh, we build a robot, but we want the robot to learn how to walk. Um, because it would have to fall over thousands of times, it's kind of impractical to have the robot learn itself. So we make a simulation and have it learn most of this in the computer. And if you let it go for thousands of times, eventually the, the robot learns how to move itself so that it can walk, uh, which is pretty cool. So in summary, artificial intelligence is implemented via, via basically a bunch of coupled math equations. You have an equation from one set of neurons that feeds into another set of neurons and on and on. But you can have hundreds of parameters for the very simple models, but hundreds of millions of parameters that go into these deep learning models. So it can know a lot and it can figure out a lot. When we train the models, we're just adjusting all of those weight parameters very slowly in order to make the outputs match what we expect the outputs to be for our labeled data then we can apply the model to some other data that we haven't seen or it has never seen before to give us good answers. Uh, applications for this are pretty much anywhere where you might have a human trying to make a decision. And so we do this a lot in detector design, data analysis, data quality monitoring, control systems, and many more places around. So that's all that I have, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have now. Thank you, David. We have several questions that were pre-submitted, um, but we also are encouraging people that are attending to use their uh, chat box to ask questions to you now, and I can uh, read those off to you as they come in. Um, the first question we have is, how do the GPUs used for science differ from the GPUs in video gaming systems? Ah, that's a good question. One of the big differences in it is that in, in science, and uh, we will have a data center where we have many, many boxes, computers, and each one of those boxes, which is a little different from your box at home, uh, will have many of these cards put into them. And so you end up running into a real problem with heat. Uh, the, doing these kind of calculations does take power, it takes a lot of power, and it produces a lot of heat as a byproduct. And so you need to get rid of that uh, heat in some way. And if you put a lot of these things into the, the gaming cards into your machines, you may not be able to, actually you wouldn't be able to dissipate the heat quite as 
uh, efficiently as you can with the um, data center cards. Okay, great. The next question we have is, what are the biggest projects that Jefferson Lab is using AI or machine learning for? Oh, that's another good question. So there's there's quite a number of projects. Uh, one of the big ones that we have is um, over in the accelerator. The, the, we have a big electron accelerator here, and um, it's a big, complicated machine with lots and lots of pieces in it. Um, and occasionally, sometimes it can parts of it can trip off. They can go into a fault. It's, it's a, a a temporary situation, but it does mean the beam goes away for several seconds. Um, and they've tried to use AI now to predict when a, uh, one of those things is going to go into a fault or what caused the fault. Eventually, they're going to use this to prevent the faults, which means for the same amount of time, we'll be able to get more beam and be able to do more science. Running the accelerator is a very expensive thing, uh, money-wise and in people's time. And so the more efficient we can make that run, uh, the better off we are. Another big thing that we're using it for is trying to do optimization of the design of detectors for new experiments that we're going to do. And a lot of work is being done right now on designing detectors and optimizing them for uh, the electron-ion collider. That is one of the biggest nuclear physics experiments in the history of mankind that's being uh, put together now, and Jefferson Lab is deeply involved in that. So there's another one where there's a lot of activity. Okay, we have a couple uh, that were submitted in the chat box. Um, the first one is, what is the difference between machine learning and deep learning? Yeah, that's a good question. Deep learning, I would say, is just a, a type of machine learning. We usually refer to deep learning as having just a lot of layers. So when I showed the network on the very first slide and it had two layers in it, that was really just as an example. Most of them would have a, a few hidden layers, but deep learning models will end up having dozens of hidden layers in there. So that's those are the ones where you end up with hundreds of millions of parameters in them. So, so deep learning is just a, a big network. Okay, the next one is how many hours and how many samples does it take to train the AI models that you're using? Oh uh, yeah, that's another good question and it's actually very um, context dependent because some of these models we may have that we're training on um, just to recognize whether images are good or bad uh, for like the monitoring that I was talking about earlier, uh, those we can, we can train up in a couple of hours uh, using a GPU. Uh, there are other things though that may uh, take a lot longer and that can actually run for a couple of days in order to train up these really big models uh, that do some very complicated things. So it depends a lot on what the data set is and how complicated the model is. Uh, some types of models lend themselves better to the architecture of GPUs than others. And so if you have a, a like a convolutional neural network model, that works really well on GPUs. Um, but there can be some other types of models that don't work so well, so you don't get quite as much of a speed up. You may have to spend more time uh, to train those models up. Okay, the next one is, um, are there some challenges in implementing AI in some things such as FPGAs? Oh, uh, FPGAs, yeah, field programmable gate arrays. So these are a technology, yeah, that we are actually looking at very carefully now because um, it is very, it's, that has been around for a little while, but they also do lend themselves very well to running AI models. These are extremely fast devices that are good for inference. The GPUs we use a lot for the training, they're also good for inference. Inference is just running the model, putting a set of inputs and how long does it take until you get the outputs. Um, but FPGAs are things that are incredibly fast because um, they're not exactly doing a calculation. It's more like you're flipping dominoes. You set up this complicated set of dominoes, and you push one, and then you see how the pattern emerges on the other side. So we can, we're really looking closely at that for doing things like triggering in our system. Triggering is where we, we look at the outputs of some detectors and decide whether or not we want to save the event, if it's a good fit event, uh, interesting physics or not. Um, and uh, there, there's some other applications where we may have for these as well, but it is a very... Um, uh, exciting and dynamic uh, field that we're investigating at this point. Okay, the next one uh, was a pre-submitted one. Um, what checks and balances are in place for ensuring that systems controlled by AI and machine learning are doing what they're supposed to, or the data collected using AI and machine learning isn't corrupted by some glitch or in an algorithm? Um, none whatsoever. That's why robots will take over the world. I'm kidding. So we put in a lot. Um, there's there's any type of thing that you do, you have to uh, you have to put in some kind of check on it, even if it wasn't an AI model. 
So even if we had things that were, were done with just algorithms that people wrote, we have to go through a large set of checks and balances um, to make sure that it's given us the right output and um, that we've tested it, uh, stress tested it in various different ways. Also, I would say when we put systems, uh, when we outfit them with AI, we're not doing it just let, setting it up and letting it go. We tend to, with like any system, we'll have it give a suggestion and a human is gonna be there to look at the suggestion and say, does this make sense? And they have to uh, accept or reject the thing. So, um, so it does take a lot of effort and it actually is a, um, a big um, field right now for people to say, what is the interpretability of the AI model? Um, can we look at the uncertainty of its output? We wanna know whether or not, uh, if it gives us a number, the number's only so good if we don't know how accurate that number. So we want it to be able to estimate the uncertainty of the outputs. So there is a lot of effort put into that. So I'm going to summarize the next one. Um, AI works on the past data and arranges it in a different manner. How long do you believe it would take AI to be like human intelligence? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I wish I had a better answer to that. You, you could go through and calculate what are the number of neurons that you have in your brain? How many neural connections are there? And, um, and I know that you can look on the web and find this. Unfortunately, I don't have the number off the top of my head. But um, then you can calculate what is the, uh, how many, uh, how deep does your network need to be to, to have the same depth as a human brain? That would be one way of estimating it. Um, it's not gonna happen in the next year, uh, but you can anticipate just at the exponential growth that we've seen of computational technology over the last decade, that we are gonna catch up to it at some point, that um, we'll have the technology to completely um, mimic the size and scale of the human brain. Whether we'll be able to get AI to really act or think like a human is not clear. Uh, to be honest, the way that we really look at AI now is it's very specialized in the jobs that it does. Um, I would kind of put it in uh, context like, I have a calculator. Um, the calculator can do math really fast. In fact, it can do a lot faster math than I can do if I get sit down with a piece of paper. What it can't do is cook me a gourmet meal. Uh, what it can't do is uh, tell me um, something about whether or not the, uh, it would be a good day to go swimming or not. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things that, that I can think of through my vast experience of having lived life that goes into my brain that it's hard to put all of that into one particular device. So I think we're probably going to be using AI as very targeted towards specific jobs, and that we'll be very good at that job and even better than humans at that job, but it doesn't mean it's going to replace humans all around because we do a lot more than just one job. Okay, we have two more questions in the chat and it's probably all we're gonna be able to get to with the time that we have remaining. The first one is, do you use consumer grade video gaming GPUs or is there a more niche brand that are better suited for training AI models? No, the, the, the gaming cards are just fine, actually. If you have a gaming card or wanna get a gaming card and put it in your own machine, uh, you will get the same kind of speed up because it's the same core technology that's in it uh, that we use here. You, you'll just be limited on how many gaming cards you could put into your box as opposed to uh, one of these big server boxes that can hold uh, 16 of them at a time. Okay, and the last question we have time for is how would one start learning to code AI systems from scratch? I see things like the Python libraries tend to be just black box libraries where you input data and get data out. Well, okay, that's a good question. I will say that uh, Python is one of the, the, the most popular languages for doing uh, programming in AI right now. Uh, you can do it in any language. There are packages for, for Java, C++, Julia is another, that one's actually kind of on the rise right now. But um, Python is where I would suggest getting started. And um, it, it may seem like a black box, and, and in some sense you do have to kind of accept that uh, you're not gonna necessarily go in and understand every line of code in their library. Uh, you're free to write your own, but then you're gonna be spending all your time doing that rather than learning the data science that you wanna learn. So um, I would say go out and look for the MNIST data set, M-N-I-S-T. There's all kinds of examples out there. That's the handwritten digits, and you can train an AI up very quickly on something like Google Colab, which allows you to go in and write uh, Python scripts right on your web browser. Uh, and do training of things like that. Okay, that's the last question, David, so I'll turn it back over to you. All right, well, thank you very much, and I, I do appreciate everybody tuning in today. 
um, I will just uh, throw out a pitch for uh, the next Bite Size Science uh, series lecture that we have, and that's going to come up on July 22nd at the same time. Holly's going to talk about uh, nuclear physics, what's going on in the proton, and I can tell you that there's a lot more going on there than you probably think there is. So I would encourage you to, to tune into that. Thank you.